Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. The special master appointed to review the documents seized at Mar-a-Lago holds his first public hearing. Trump's legal team declined to say if the documents were classified. Weeks away from midterms, Democrats are ramping up a last-ditch effort to change the way campaigns operate. They say it's exposing dark money, while Republicans call it an effort to federalize elections. The White House says they've received reports that illegal immigrants are being flown to Delaware. Now officials in President Biden's home state are making preparations. An FBI whistleblower alleges that the Bureau is overstating the threat of domestic violent extremism. Congressman Jim Jordan says that more than a dozen FBI agents have come forward as whistleblowers in recent months. And Hurricane Fiona blasting through the Caribbean. It's expected to keep gaining strength and make landfall in yet another island. We start with an update on the documents seized from Mar-a-Lago. Judge Raymond Deary asked Trump's attorneys if they had any objections to declaring some of them as classified. Deary asked the question at his first hearing as special master. The senior judge wanted to clarify whether or not Trump's team agreed that some 100 documents were classified. Those are the same documents the Department of Justice had previously tried to block Deary from seeing. Former President Trump's attorney said it would be premature to answer the question until his team had an opportunity to review the documents. The parties have until September 25th to file any objections to Deary's proposed agenda for the review. Meanwhile, the DOJ has also appealed part of Judge Eileen Cannon's ruling, which restricted the FBI's access to only those 100 documents with classified markings. And President Biden and Democrats are pushing to require campaign groups to disclose big money donors. They say it's a way to expose dark money, while Republicans say it's another effort to federalize elections. NTD's Melina Weiskup has the details. There's much too much money that flows in the shadows to influence our elections. It's called dark money. The 2022 midterm election cycle is among us, and Democrats are concerned about campaign donors. Right now, advocacy groups can run ads on issues attacking or supporting a candidate right until Election Day without disclosing who's paying for that ad. A bill dubbed the Disclose Act would require greater transparency into who is behind campaign advertising. For example, super PACs are independent political action committees, which may raise unlimited sums of money from corporations, unions, and individuals to run ads. Groups like this would have to disclose donors who contributed more than $10,000 during an election cycle. But Republicans say it goes a step too far. This Disclose Act is designed to target and harass speech that the left doesn't like. It is bla blazingly unconstitutional. But the bill has lingered in Congress for more than a decade. When it was last brought up in the Senate 10 years ago, Republican leader Mitch McConnell decried it as a Democrat effort to, quote, pick and choose who gets to speak in elections and how much they speak. But the bill sponsor, Senator Whitehouse, says it's important to go on record. Who wants to remove the dark money toxin from America's political system? And who insists on protecting and defending it? Schumer vowed a vote this week, but it's unlikely to have the Republican support needed to pass. And while the Senate is taking action with this bill, the House is also trying to move a different bill related to elections. That is the Presidential Election Reform Act. This one is meant to reform the 1887 Electoral Count Act, making it harder to overturn presidential election results. So while both chambers are moving very different election reform bills, it is clear that Democrat leadership is trying to message to voters right now, just ahead of midterms, that Democrat Democrats are trying to do something in regards to election reform, especially after they fail to pass voting rights legislation all year. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. And the White House says it's aware of reports of a flight carrying illegal immigrants to Delaware. Officials in President Biden's home state are preparing to receive the migrants who could be dropped off there very soon. NTD's Jason Perry has that story. 
I don't have the specific. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean Pierre said they were aware of reports of a flight from Texas carrying migrants to an area near President Biden's vacation home in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. I can tell you that we've been closely coordinating uh, with um, uh, uh, the folks in Delaware, the officials in Delaware. What I can tell you that uh, our heads up did not come from Governor DeSantis because his only goal is, uh, as he's made it really quick, clear, is to create chaos. And I haven't heard a peep about all the people that have been told by Biden you can just come in and they're going, they're being abused by the cartels, they're drowning in the Rio Grande. You had 50 that died in some shed in Texas. I heard no outrage about any of that. Uh, I haven't heard outrage about all the fentanyl that's come across the border that's killing Americans in record numbers. I don't hear I don't hear outrage about the criminal aliens that have gotten through and have then victimized people not only in Florida but all throughout the country. I didn't hear any outrage about that. The only thing I hear them getting upset about is you have 50 that end up in Martha's Vineyard. Then they get really upset. I spoke with Dan Stein, president of the Federation for American Immigration Reform, or FAIR, and he added this. Well, the big problem and the elephant in the room is why did Joe Biden destroy immigration controls in the first place? Then he explained some of the effects of illegal immigration. It causes housing shortages and overcrowding, reduces wages, erodes the bargaining leverage of American workers, and generally destroys the American quality of life. It doesn't matter what you're trying to do. If you can't project the number of people using something, schools, hospitals, or what have you, you can't provide adequate government infrastructure to provide those services. And it's basic common sense. U.S. Customs and Border Protection reported that agents have encountered over 2 million illegal immigrants in the last 11 months. Jason Perry, NTD News. President Biden said today that his administration is working with Mexico and other countries to stop illegal immigration. He commented that there are fewer immigrants from Mexico and most of Central America, but more from Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. And other... FBI whistleblower has come forward, claiming that the Bureau overstates the threat of domestic violent extremism. This is according to Congressman Jim Jordan, ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee. According to Congressman Jim Jordan, the whistleblower said the FBI is manipulating case files to make it seem like America has a bigger domestic violent extremism problem than it actually does, and that this is happening while the FBI is redirecting resources away from child sexual abuse investigations to prioritize January 6th cases. The whistleblower alleged that, quote, the FBI's case categorization creates the illusion that threats from domestic violent extremism are present in jurisdictions across the nation, when in reality they all stem from the same related investigation concerning the actions at the Capitol on January 6th. Jordan said that over a dozen FBI agents have come forward to him as whistleblowers in recent months. Mark Sherwood, a former SWAT team member with the Tulsa Police Department, told NTD it's essential those people come forward if they notice illegal activity. They have a duty, not an option, a duty to come forward. And the American people are going to appreciate them and call them heroes because they already are. He argues that with changes, agencies can earn back their reputations. Sherwood says he knows how hard it is for officers and agents to blow the whistle on their superiors and team members because their careers are often on the line. NTD reached out to the FBI for comment. The Bureau said in part, quote, The FBI is charged with protecting the American people from a wide variety of threats. Our commitment to one does not come at the expense of another. The threat posed by domestic violent extremists is persistent, evolving, and deadly. We are committed to upholding the constitutional rights of all Americans and will never open an investigation based solely on First Amendment activity. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. And in health news, three hospitals are facing lawsuits alleging they didn't get patient consent for COVID-19 treatments, which led to wrongful death. NTD's Daniel Hall hears from the attorneys. In the Fresno, California area, two attorneys announced lawsuits on September 7th against three medical centers over alleged wrongful deaths related to COVID-19 treatments. The attorneys, representing 14 families, alleged that patients were not given informed consent about the potential dangers of taking the drug remdesivir. Remdesivir is a drug that was tested in some Ebola trials a few years back 
during those tests, it killed 53.1% of all the people that it was given to. It was considered far too dangerous to be used, and it was pulled from the Ebola trial and banned. Michael Hamilton, one of the lawyers suing the medical centers, added that the WHO concluded in a study that remdesivir should never be given to COVID patients regardless of their symptoms. But in the United States, Hamilton talked about the remdesivir protocol. He alleges that it happens across the country in a similar way. Hospitals tell patients they have COVID pneumonia. They're placed on remdesivir, then isolated from their families, put in an ICU, intubated, and if they resist, they're tied down and sedated. And the average time to death for somebody in this situation is, as I understand it, about nine days. Hamilton said that hospitals charge about $3,200 for regular COVID outpatient services. But for inpatient cases, what hospitals call non-complex cases, run about $111,000. Complex inpatient cases, which the remdesivir protocol falls under, is roughly $450,000 per patient. On top of that, the government has incentivized the use of remdesivir by offering a 20% bonus if a hospital uses it as an exclusive remedy, which on a $450,000 charge rate is roughly an extra 90000 The lawsuit alleges remdesivir received emergency use authorization in or around May of 2020 after being recommended by an NIH panel that contained nine individuals with financial ties to its creator, Gilead Sciences. Daniel Watkins, another attorney also suing, alleges that the hospitals violated informed consent procedures in these cases. The lawsuits are in fact predicated on two concepts. One is medical deception and two is unconsented to medical care. You have these facilities intentionally withholding information that's critical to the decision making process for the patient. Then on top of that, we have several of our clients who, despite objecting to the use of remdesivir, were in fact administered the drug as part of the protocol. The hospitals involved are the St. Agnes Medical Center, Community Regional Medical Center, and Clovis Community Medical Center. The three medical centers said they could not comment on pending litigation. Daniel Hall, NTD News, California. And staying in California, a court in San Francisco says it will erase millions of dollars in traffic fine late fees. The debt relief is part of a statewide reform effort. NTD's Jason Blair has more. $50 million in civil assessments have been erased by a San Francisco court. The city treasurer's office announced the move in a statement last week. A civil assessment is a $300 fee issued when a person doesn't pay a traffic court fine on time or fails to appear in court. The city eliminated 180,000 of these fees. The action is in line with Assembly Bill 199, which also changes the fee from $300 to $100 moving forward. Revenue from these fees will now be collected into California's general fund instead of to local courts. This change aims to shift any incentive courts might have to issue more fines or fees. Ann Stuhl Dreyer, director of the Financial Justice Project in the office of San Francisco Treasurer Jose Cenero said, quote, California should not fund our local courts by asking the courts to impose fees that they benefit from. Courts should be funded separate and apart from these fees. Eliminating the debt from this unfair and unnecessary fee and lowering it is a common sense reform and an important step forward. It will bring relief to hundreds of thousands of Californians. All fees issued before July 1, 2022 are now erased. Fees issued after have been reduced to $100. According to last week's statement issued by the San Francisco Treasurer's Office, about one-third of traffic fines in the city were not paid on time and issued the fee. Jason Blair, NTD News, San Francisco. And Hurricane Fiona blasted Turks and Caicos today while Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic are still rep recovering. At least four people have reportedly died so far. On Tuesday morning, Hurricane Fiona's eye passed close to Grand Turk, the capital island of the small British territory. By then it was a Category 3 hurricane with maximum sustained winds of over 110 miles per hour. It's moving north-northwest away from the U.S. mainland. 
To the south, the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico are trying to cope with the aftermath. In Puerto Rico, Fiona dumped up to 30 inches of rain in some areas. 80 percent of residents remain without power. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer on Tuesday criticized the companies supplying the island with electricity. The Puerto Rican Energy Bureau must push PREPA and LUMA not only to restore power, but to once and for all create a distributed, more resilient grid, and we will back them up. These two agencies, PREPA and LUMA, cannot stand in the way once again. PREPA and LUMA are somewhat connected. They've been criticized in the past for alleged neglect of the power system. Officials said it would take days to reconnect the whole island of over 3 million people. Tuesday marks exactly five years after the devastating Hurricane Maria made landfall in Puerto Rico. And in the Dominican Republic, residents are still recovering after a direct hit from Hurricane Fiona left several villages isolated without power and water. 800 people had to evacuate, and more than 11,000 people were without power. It is a disaster. We lost everything here, and everything got wet. We lost our home. I am ruined. I lost everything. The U.S. National Hurricane Center expects the storm to develop into a Category 4 hurricane, hit Bermuda on Friday, and eventually impact to the very eastern parts of Canada over the weekend, although it's expected to have lost strength by that time. Reporting by Arian Pastar, NTD News. Coming up, ongoing talks on the Hill about decoupling from China. What some tell us about how the U.S. should deter threats from the Chinese Communist Party. And in basketball, with the conclusion of the WNBA season, some players are looking to play overseas. But Brittany Griner's situation in Russia has changed those options. That and more coming up. Welcome to RenBiz.com, the education and career program where parents rule. We replace public schools and universities. We are for ages 6 to 100. Never any big student loans with us. You graduate with a traditional diploma, a university degree, and your own family business. Adults returning to obtain better careers. Parents looking for better academic and career opportunities for their kids. At Business Education, you spend 50% of your time on traditional education and 50% on business education, including setting up your own family business. Learning is in your small in-person pods of 6 to 10 students. At Renaissance Business Education, a.k.a. RenBiz.com, graduation means you have a degree and your own family business. Like education always should have been, a transition to getting a career. The White House once more walks back President Biden's vows to defend Taiwan against a Chinese invasion. Lawmakers and activists are warning against the threat Beijing poses to the U.S. NTD's Iris Tao has more on a forum today at the Capitol. It is unbelievable how much funding we are doing of a communist country. Calling to decouple from China, Congressman Louis Gohmert joins a Tuesday forum inside the U.S. Capitol to highlight threats posed by the Chinese Communist Party. The problem with communism is atheism. Government must be God. And so people aren't free to seek and look for truth. But I'm asking this question for myself, are we really free or not? Also speaking at the forum, NBA free agent and human rights activist Ernest Cantor Freedom. He shares about the pressure he faced here inside the U.S. for speaking out against Beijing. In game, one of my teammates woke up to me in a locker room and said, you know this is your last year in NBA, right? Like, you know, you talk about the Chinese government, you talk about, you calling out Nike, you calling out some of the players who are bowing down to these dictatorships, your career is over. Freedom tells NTD that China is undermining freedoms in the U.S. by infiltrating Wall Street, NBA, Hollywood and even government institutions. No one can invade uh, USA from the outside. 
but they're trying to invade USA from the inside. Meanwhile, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi on Monday called for greater cooperation between the two countries, saying it will benefit both China and the U.S. But Congressman Gohmert says this about China. This could be one of our greatest allies in the world, could be our greatest ally, but never as long as the Chinese government is in charge. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. And turning now to the Russia-Ukraine war. Moscow-backed separatists in Ukraine set out plans for referendums on joining Russia. A top Putin ally gave support for the plans, while the U.S. rejected them. Officials in parts of Ukraine controlled by Russia signaled Tuesday that they are moving forward with referendum votes. That includes the two breakaway regions of Donetsk and Luhansk. They're voting on allowing Russia to annex them. The referendums will start on the Friday and last five days. A top Putin ally, the former president, Dmitry Medvedev, says he favors the move. If the Russian allied forces formally annex the region, it would be a serious escalation for Moscow against the U.S. and its allies. That's because, according to Medvedev, that anyone attacking the areas is attacking Russia itself, and it's legally entitled to self-defense. So far, the West has been careful not to supply Ukraine with weapons that could be used to shell Russian territory. President Biden has previously warned that a direct military confrontation would become World War III. The White House on Tuesday rejected Russia's plans. We know that Russia will use these sham referenda as a basis uh, to purportedly annex these territories, either now or in the future. Let me be clear, if this does transpire, and obviously it's not a done deal yet, but if this does transpire, the United States will never recognize Russia's claims, claims to any purportedly annexed parts of Ukraine. The White House said Moscow may be making the move to recruit troops in those areas after suffering extensive losses on the battlefield. Meanwhile, Ukraine's government says the threat of referendums is, quote, naive blackmail and a sign that Russia is scared. Combined, the areas in question are about 15 percent of Ukrainian territory, an area the size of Portugal. And now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. The WNBA season concluded Sunday when the Las Vegas Aces topped the Connecticut Sun in Game 4 to win the championship. In past years, this was a time where players made their overseas exodus in search of a bigger payday. But according to WNBA star Brianna Stewart, that tradition won't include Russia, which has typically been the preferred destination in past years because of their higher salaries. Said Stewart, quote, my time in Russia has been wonderful, but especially with Brittany Griner still wrongfully detained there, nobody's going to go there until she's home. Stewart is one of the nearly dozen players who were on a Russian team last year, but none are planning to go back this year, according to the Associated Press. Griner was arrested in February on drug possession charges and was sentenced to nine years in prison. In football news, former NFL greats Joe Thomas, Darrell Rivas, and Dwight Freeney highlight the list of nine first-time nominees for the NFL's Hall of Fame. Thomas was a six-time All-Pro tackle for the Cleveland Browns, who made 10 Pro Bowls but never saw the postseason. Rivas, known as Rivas Island, was a shutdown corner who played most of his career for the New York Jets, earning four All-Pro nods and a Super Bowl ring in his lone season in New England. Freeney was a pass-rushing great who did most of his damage for the Indianapolis Colts, earning three All-Pro selections, seven Pro Bowl nods, and a Super Bowl title. The three are among 129 eligible for the latest class, which will be announced next January. And finally, tonight in sports, 15 baseball games are on the schedule, including a Yankees-Pirates matchup with Aaron Judge just two home runs away from the AL record. That's all for your sports news today. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox.
Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.